Hey, Darth. Where's his headset? There you go, girl. Yes. I would have appreciated had she asked me directly to hold me. I was not up for that. Oh, he's finally going to poop. Good boy. Yeah, he needed that.
boy. 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 Doesn't look sore, Abby. He doesn't look sore. Did you treat him? Yeah. I can tell. He he started off a little like. What's that? Yes, well, if I, if I have used the shambone, then the next step, when I get the horse understanding stretching, would be this. I personally don't use shambones very often myself. Um, it's a good thing for people who are just trying to learn this and teaching their horses that don't have a lot of skills. But once you learn to uh, do the work in hand well, you would rarely, as I said, I, I haven't put a shambone on a horse myself in years, you know, just because I don't generally need to. But, once I get to the stretch in hand, most horses I can get to where I want to with just using side rings. So it's a good thing. And you know, the short bone is really for horses that are extremely upside down. You know, once you learn this process, you know. So this is pretty much the way I do them at home myself. Is I teach them the stretch in hand, and then I start working them with long side rings. But as I said, if there's somebody, you know, the shambone is the only device that it's, it's, unless you put it too tight, it's hard to screw up with. And just like side range, you should never have to pull a horse's head down to connect them. If you do, they're going to have do more damage than the good. There's a great book on show jumping. It's one of the ones I suggest for everyone's library. It's on the right track with everything else that we do. It's called Training Show Jumpers by Anthony Paleman. P-A-A-L-M-A-N. And he has a really good expose on the use of the shambo in that book. And he was the gold medaling, medal winning uh, jumper trainer and rider from uh, Ireland. And was their coach for a long time. An excellent book. The best book I could ever find on jumping that I've ever found. So to me, the two books you, you really need, or if you're into jumping, is that one. But also, if you want to learn more about, he has a, numerous chapters on how to use the shambone and what it does in the developmental stages of it and all that sort of thing. So if you had that book and you had Dressage Formula by 
uh, Eric Herberman, which is really by a young man, Nyberg, you really wouldn't need, need much more. <laughs> Those books pretty much cover it all in the right way. Unfortunately, the good books are all getting kind of hard to find these days. I'm done going this way, aren't I? I can't tell you how many people that I start teaching come to me and say, well, my last teacher told me not to read books on writing because I'd be confused. Yeah, because <laughs> they don't say it all what the trainer's doing. <laughs> you would be confused. But there are lots of bad books on writing out there, or vanity books. Most of the current books are just vanity books written by people who've never really been much trainers. I worked with them, they got hollow, I brought them onto that little smaller circle. Got them to yield the hindquarters a little bit, and then I got what I wanted. I'll do it again, every time you get the little hollow on me, then a little bit that way. It likes to stall out on this one. Easily. Once again, I'll keep you mind a little bit of a smaller circle. Not so small that he can't trot, though. Not used to an audience. And is that every time he disengages, I bring him on a little smaller circle. What are you guys doing over Start there? Disengage, I let it right back out again. Starts to disengage, I bring him back over again. Tired.
Every time he gets distracted, I just bring him on a smaller circle. So I get him where I want him again, and I need to reward him by making it easier. Come on, Simon, try something different.
course, there's a lot of things that we can force a horse to do, but of course, relaxation is never one of them. <laughs> the one thing you can't beat, prod, or whatever into, you simply got to wait for it. Now you come and try the other side. So was he absolutely perfect there? I had to wait until he was going really good, then all of a sudden whatever gets in their head, I had to wait for him to come around and stretch one more time. Okay. So you saw an idea. Whenever he's hollow, hold there, son. I'm actually I'm just going to shorten these a little bit so he has a little more contact. He gets high up in the head there a little bit. So getting the side reins to just the right length, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. it's really important that we get find just that little spot where when he tries to go too high and feels the contact at just the right moment and puts him back in the stretch, but we don't want to ever just tie them down to us. Okay, get that right. Let's see how you do. Right where he is, don't lean over, stretch your upper body up, stretch up, stretch up, stretch up. The more you lean over, the more weak you look to the horse. You make yourself into a little, you ought to make yourself big, you know, <laughs> be a cobra. <laughs> so when horses see us shrinking away from them, or shrinking in front of them like you're doing right now, stretch your chest up, it's like you're riding, posture. There you go. There, now he starts to stretch, then let him out a little bit. So see, every little bit he starts to stretch, you let him out a little bit more, like that. There we go. But they're always a little more difficult in one way or the other at this stage. Just bring him in a little bit, bring him in, there you go. As soon as he drops down, you let him back out. There you go. That. Take up the slack. So I want there to be no slack between you and the horse all the time. So when he comes in at you, take up the slack. There. All right, all right. There. And again, stretch yourself up. You're starting to sink on me again. Stretch up. Very 
get a little bigger circle. There we go. Because whatever they're doing on the lunge line, they will do with you when you get on. I'm going to be honest with that way. So if they're still totally resisting the bit, they're going to resist it when you get on as well. So that's why I always say, I don't get on a horse because it looks like something on a ride. But it has a nice steady rhythm over its back. And once again, you can get all that and just kind of ride away at the level the horse can go. That's really good. Keep that. Really good now. Keep it going. Don't let it stall. Don't let it stall. Keep watching that back end to see what it's doing. There you go. Much better now. There you go. Keep that going. That's like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now he's starting to stabilize a little bit. Good Good boy. Good boy. Black out of the ring. Very nice. That's nice. Keep it going. Just a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's starting to look a little more like something that you'd like to get on, isn't it? A little more active. Shortening the uh, launch line, Abigail. A little more active. The dying. The plane's gonna fall out of the air. Keep it going. <laughs> Good boy. Nicely, like zooming right there, now that's a good walk. <laughs> <laughs> he was so ready. That was good. So that's what we want to get to, that point where we, all that nonsense, all the head shaking, all the nonsense goes away. That's good for something. You got to a good place. Very nice. Now we have a horse that we can think about getting off. Very nicely done. <laughs> As I said, if the horse hasn't settled in the bridle, there's really no point in getting on it. It's not going to be better or better when you get on it than it is without you on it. Mm -hmm. It's always worse. So if we get to that point where it starts really consistent, we have a good rhythm over its back, then we have a really good chance of succeeding once we actually get on the horse. Or succeeding in a way that would be useful for us all, of course included. 